similar to Salita, um, I'm an agile coach. I have been um, working with different organizations since 2003. In terms of experience, I have been working face-to-face -face and remotely with different teams around the world. We're talking about from small organizations to Fortune 500 organizations. In some of the countries, I have the pleasure to uh, to, to go and to work with uh, different people are um, Australia, United Kingdom, Venezuela, Switzerland, New Zealand, the United States, and last but not least now in Canada for Loblo, um, for an organization called Loblo that most of you might already know. Okay. So let's go with the agenda for today. So for today, we're going to be talking about, um, and this is in a nutshell, different uh, different aspects around neuro agility. Um, but in essence, these are the five different topics that we would like to cover for this afternoon. So we're going to start with um, a concept, or a, we're going to be talking about sustaining change. We're going to be talking about learning organizations. Of course, you might be curious about what is this about neuroagility. We're going to be talking about that. Um, we're going to be exploring some of the uh, factors that um, neuroagility study to, to talk about learning only, not only for individuals, but also for organizations. And last but not least, we're going to have a group activity that hopefully we will be able to run with all of you. Savita? So the world today is rapidly changing and we know that uh, some of us called it a disruptive world. Due to today's market computation, many organizations have been forced to go through a business transformation or technical transformation. And uh, we keep on, I think I see my, is it better now? I think time to time we get that echo. I closed my hop-in application, so it should be good. So I was talking about the rapidly changing and disruptive world. Um, so we know that many organizations are going through agile transformation or business transformation or technical transformation, and it's too much for the employees to keep up their skills as per the need. So increasing the agile brain power of every individual leader and team uh, will help us reduce the cost of change and enable us to think and learn faster. Go to the next slide. So the challenge of having this disruptive change uh, is the lack of skills to cope with information overload. So the first point. Sorry, Savita, we are we we get the echo again for some reason. I'm not getting any echo. I haven't the entire session so far, so it okay. might be localized to certain listeners. Okay. So Merit, maybe you should also log out mm -hmm. from hop in. Sure. Okay, so uh, the first point around this uh, challenge of having the disruptive change is the technology is changing in a faster speed and we are exposed to too much of data every day. As you know that we have so many digital channels these days, WhatsApp, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, Instagram, and from all over these digital channels, we keep on getting a lot of data. A single weekly edition of the New York Times contains more information than a person would have been exposed in a lifetime during the 17th century. This is, this is the stat as per the research. So we are dealing with too much of data these days. The next thing is that um, an estimated 75 to 90% of all illnesses as per the medical research has its origin in chronic stress. So information overload is quickly become one of the greatest sources of stress. And we also talk about nowadays, whatever we learn, 90% of that we forget in a week as per research. So we have to reinforce or remember again 
Um, and the biggest reason, particularly why we are working from home, is multitasking as well. Another thing is that, um, as per the estimate, um, if people won't upskill because of all these transformations and market demand, 60 to 70 pe percent of people will lose their job. So you have to keep on adapting as per the market need. The last point is that as per stats, 80 to 90% of serious injuries and accidents have been attributed to human error. And it's all because people don't have downtime to process information and think efficiently. So all these challenges we are facing in today's world because of the fast disruptive change. Please go to the next slide. So, um, so we have been looking into some of the research or stats from ongoing um, uh, research happening. Uh, what are all the top skills required in uh, today's uh, workplace? And this is the reference from the Forbes article. Um, as per Forbes article, there are top 10 desired skills at workplace. You may notice that most of these skills are brain power skills like creativity, problem solving, resilience, agility. Uh, we can all develop all these skills over the period of time, but to do that, we need the brain fitness. And that's why neuro agility has become so important in today's century. Go to the next one. Okay, so we have been talking about um, disruptive and transformative change. Um, we have been talking about all these different elements that are being exhibited right now around the world and some of the challenges in terms of the skills and elements that employees are supposed to exhibit these days to actually be successful. But there is a big question around here. How do we sustain change? So there is um, an individual, um, sorry, called um, Ari Degas. He's a former COE of Shell Company. And he tried to answer the question by saying that organizations need to have the ability to actually learn and not only learn, but learn faster than its competitors to actually go ahead and sustain the change. So this is extremely important. So this means that now we're introducing um, a different concept, which is the fact that organization as a system, they can actually learn as well. But maybe you're asking yourself, what is a learning organization? So when it comes to learning organization, there are different experts around the world that have been studying this specific um, concept. And one of the most popular ones is come from uh, Peter Sench. Uh, what he said, and I'm going to read the, the full thing in here, you're going to get the deck at the end of the presentation. But essentially, what he said is a learning organization is an organization where people can actually expand, can create, can, and, no, and more than that, leaders in that organization are supposed to nurture those kind of practices in there. So I want to highlight the fact that he's talking about the people inside that organization. And as a collective, we know that we learn better. And that's why he's saying that, again, because people are the ones that make the organization, what we have to do is then nurture those guys to actually get better at learning. There are other experts, like for instance, Ikujiro Munaka, that also express a similar idea around learning organizations. So basically what he's saying is exactly something very, very similar. It's a company where you are supposed to be promoting uh, or these kind of behaviors around workers that are constantly getting new knowledge and they're sharing those knowledge as a whole system. But now it's time to have an activity that Savita is going to be running. Savita, can you please share? 
So um, now let's capture from the audience. What do you think uh, are the challenges in creating the learning environments uh, based on your own scenarios or experience? So what you need to do, go to any device or on your phone, just type slido.com and use this code 84547. And I'm going to share my screen to run the poll live. So go to slido.com, enter the code 84547. Okay, so we got. So the first question is, what is the most significant factor that impedes learning in organizations? Is it unclarity of goals or ignoring individual's learning style or something else? I see most of the people voted for unclarity of goals and then ignoring individual's learning styles. Okay, let's go to the next one. What do you think about monetary compensation? Does it encourage new skills acquisition or not? Interesting. That one is really interesting because different people have different viewpoint around this. Um, in the beginning or in some scenarios, definitely monitoring compensation can help. But over the period of time, some people think that we also need learning opportunities, better positions, um, a collaborative work environment. But I see most of the people going towards having good compensation. <laughs> yeah, this is very, very interesting. <laughs> So the next and the last question is, uh, what do you think, what does ob obstruct your learning? Is it mental stress, work frust frustration, lack of sleep or something else? Work frustration is quite high. Yeah. So it, it, this is very interesting because we can see here that some people are saying that that's one of the, or the main issue here, the work frustration, but they care more about monetary compensation. Yeah. Very interesting. So uh, as we are on Zoom, uh, you can unmute yourself and maybe share what do you mean by others here? Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. It's Danielle. Thanks for this session, Savita. Um, in both, a couple of those answers I said other, for, for me personally, I think one of the constraints would be like in, a, in an organization where you're trying to make it a learning organization, what I often find is, is time, right? How do you protect mm. that time in your schedule, meetings, other commitments at work so that time is a priority to foster that learning and participate in any learning activity, whether it's self or, you know, um, supported in a workshop or other. Yeah, yeah, really true. We also need time. What you will do if you get the past to attend a training, but you don't have time to attend it. Yeah. 
Okay. Anyone else could like to share anything, any kind of challenge you are facing from your learning? Okay, maybe we can go back. There's a comment or two in the uh, chat window if you want to mm -hmm. look. Or I could read them to you. Lack of yes. motivation. Yeah. Uh, for some, it's a lack of motivation, a lack of direction, or a freedom to attend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are very common factors. Absolutely. And we're going to be touching some in, in, in a way or another, we're going to be talking about all those difference later in the presentation, um, for sure. Okay, so now let's get back to the presentation. Do you want to uh, share any more comments, any comments, Sarita, before we move forward? I think we are good. Uh, we can look into some of the factors which will mm -hmm. really touch upon all these comments which we received right now. Exactly. Okay, very well. So the title or some of the, or one of the key elements of this session was around uh, near agility. Um, so for those of you that are not quite familiar with this specific concept, Neuroagility is about the brain-based factors that basically influence the easy, the speed, and the flexibility with which people learn, think, and process information. So basically, we're going to be talking about or trying to cover all those elements that maybe you need to monitor and take care in order for you to become a better learner, learner as an individual, OK? So there is a professional called André Vermeulen. Um, he's, he specializes in neuroagility and he, takes a, he has been taking a lot of time investigating this. And according to uh, this individual, there are six different factors that we need to basically monitor and be aware of to ensure that you have all the tools to become a better learner or to ensure learning, okay? So the different elements are uh, brain fitness, stress, sleep, movement, attitude, and food, okay? And we're gonna be uh, basically explaining each of these different factors so we get a better understanding of why, why they are so important. So let's get started with brain fitness. Before we uh, go deeper into what is this about, it's very important to understand that we have, and maybe some of you, the majority of you already know this, but the brain has two hemispheres, the left, the right, and the left hemisphere. When it comes to the two hemispheres, we're gonna, uh, it's important to know as well that the uh, the left side is going to be controlling all the movements and all the activities on the opposite side, and the same will happen for the right side. When we talk about brain fitness, what we're trying to say here is that basically um, the individual or when, when, you, when your brain is properly fit is because you have the ability to control both hemispheres, okay? And the not such a good news is that unfortunately we are not born with this specific attribute of controlling both hemisphere hemisphere simultaneously okay instead uh, we will need to basically exercise and exercise a lot to develop this the idea is that if you manage to utilize both hemisphere, do it simultaneously, then you will become a cutting edge individual. And what we meant to say with this is that you will be able to basically digest a large volume of data faster and it will be more natural for you, okay? So there are a few recommendations that we can give around this specific topic just to ensure your brain fitness and how do you exercise your brain. So the first element is, of course, to have some mental 
exercise. So I'm gonna show you right now one of uh, one that is very, very easy that you can practice by yourself. So hopefully as you can see in the screen right now, all you have to do is put your hands together like this. And then you're gonna try to touch your the, the tip of your nose with one hand and with the opposite hand, just crossing your arms like this, you're gonna touch your ear. Then you will clap and do the opposite. Do the clap and try the same. So you will realize that I think it looks kind of silly, right? But it takes some time for the brain to digest or to understand if you're moving in the right direction. It, it takes a little bit of time to digest, to understand how to coordinate that movement. So that is an excellent exercise. The other thing that you can do is while you're working now with COVID-19, try to change your activity. So it's, um, it's proven that for instance, if you work for a particular time, a period of time on an activity and then you change that activity and just switch from activity A to activity B, what's gonna happen is that you're gonna bring some oxygen to your brain and that's gonna, um, it create the right atmosphere to your brain so it doesn't get that that bad in there. Uh, try to read in action, like the actual handwriting, try to use your hand to write down because that's gonna stimulate your brain as well. Try to learn new things and, and just to finalize the list for now, try to exercise as well. And we all know that exercising is the key to keep a healthy body. Okay, any questions about this specific uh, factor? <laughs> yeah, it's really hard to do the exercise. So just practice because that's gonna keep your brain uh, in shape. The second uh, factor in here will be around stress, okay? So before we jump and start talking about stress, uh, I would like to share with you a little bit of information, a little bit of background. Remember when I mentioned that you have your left hemisphere and your right hemisphere. So essentially each hemisphere is going to take care of some of the abilities that you are going to have as a learner. So if we look at the graph right now, we'll have in one side that the right hemisphere is gonna be taking off all that, all those different, um, I would say, skills that are more in, into the soft side with the arts, with the feelings, with the intuition, imagination. Um, and then the left side is going to have analysis, logic, idea. It will be that numerical side of your brain. So every single of us uh, basically have a dominant side and a non-dominant side or non-dominant hemisphere. So what's gonna happen is that for people that are pretty good in math and are into more like give me the data or is very logical, that means that your dominant side will be the left hemisphere because you're pretty good at that, in, in that those specific items listed there. If on the other high side, sorry, you are into arts, feelings, um, intuition, etc. This means that you, the dominant side of your brain will be on the right side, okay? So of course, when we talk about non-dominant and dominant, that doesn't mean that it's not like you're not using your non-dominant side. You're using it, it's just that it's not as, as powerful, it's not the one that is driving, the one that is leading the process of learning. So when we talk about stress, we can say that stress can be defined as a losing control over the non-dominant side of your brain. Okay, so this means that when you lose that control, then the entire process of learning becomes slower, harder, and longer. Just to be an example, if I'm pretty good at math, logics, and things like that, and meaning that my dominant side is the left, while I enter that period of stress, what's going to happen is not that I'm, I'm zero, my creativity goes to zero. It means that 
it's going to be more difficult, like way more difficult for me to be creative, to do a painting, to express my feelings. That's exactly what is, the stress is doing for me. And we don't want that. So now, how is this related to learning and how and why do we need to cope with stress? So I'm going to share with you two, uh, two statements that you need to keep in mind um, that maybe are going to make you wonder, hmm, maybe I should take care of the stress and avoid this. So the first one is around health. Okay, so an estimate 75 to 90% 90, 90 of all illnesses, they have their, they, they, or, they, they, its origin in chronic stress. So of course, if you are sick, you won't be able to um, basically learn because obviously you're not feeling that well, right? Uh, and you don't want that at all. So one of the things that we know according to the sources is that uh, one or, or the most critical element that is creating stress for us these days is the fact that we, we are uh, ex exposed to too much data, too much information, too fast. Okay, and that brings us to the next element in here, which is around performance. So obviously, if you feel that, oh my God, this is too much information for me, you will feel over overwhelmed. And then you might feel that you're not good enough to be effective, okay? So some of the recommendations that we can share with you around this specific factor are in the agile environment, just to give an example, if you're a Scrum Master or in any organization as a leader, try to create a psych uh, a space that is safe where people can share their ideas and their feelings. Uh, try to set working agreements between you and the team or you and that individual that you are working with just to ensure that you are very clear about how you're going to be handling stressful situations. Uh, of course, exercise, yoga, if, for instance, you have the opportunity to reach out to health specialists in your organization, usually they bring a little, they can, they offer support to the employees. So take advantage of those um, different things. Take breaks. With COVID-19, it seems like we're just stuck working with our computers and not moving that much. So just a step up, move around, uh, share with your family, share with the people that can actually make you feel better, just to ensure that you, that stress just goes away, okay? So, very good. So the reason, um, sorry, the next uh, factor in here will be sleep and when it comes to sleep, um, essentially what we want to, or the message I, we want you to take with you is that we need to ensure that we have a good sleep hygiene. This means that you have the proper space where you can rest and you can relax without being interrupted, okay? The idea is that you have enough and not enough time to feel relaxed, to feel okay uh, and rested. But the big question here is, do you actually know what happens to your body when you don't sleep enough? So let me share with you some facts. These are results of um, some investigations as well. And as you will see the different sources at the bottom of the slide that we are sharing uh, today. So when you don't sleep, this is exactly, or some of, these are some of the things that you might experience. So the number one thing is that basically you're preventing your brain from being able to um, basically take new memories. So just to give you an example, imagine that your brain is like a brand new database or halfway full database with some data. What is gonna happen when you, when you don't sleep is that basically you are creating a process that is going to avoid your brain from bringing more information inside. Going back to the sample of the database, you're 
placing a process in there that basically is stopping the data from being recorded inside your database. This means that you always have the same source of information and you are not adding anything new in there. So please rest, take some time to sleep. The second element that is going to happen or the, the second thing I can share with you about sleep is that if you don't sleep, this is what's happened. When you sleep, um, basically your brain um, is supposed to get rid of some toxins in there. They are the ones that basically are associated with Alzheimer's disease, which is a terrible, terrible disease. So that specific toxin is called beta amyloid. So if you keep accumulating that and you don't allow your brain to basically wash all that toxin, what happens is that it gets accumulated and then your chances to get that specific disease increases. Okay, so again, allow your body to take enough time to sleep and to rest so they have time to wash all the dirt, <laughs> okay? We, this, the next one you already know affects the reproductive system. You might already know about uh, what happened when our reproduct reproductive system is, is not working as expected. Uh, that can get pro produce a lot of stress in people, basically. And last but not least, it's going to impact your immune system and you're not, if you're, because you're not getting that reboot of your cardiovascular system, so your blood pressure rises. Essentially, I don't know if you have noticed this, but people that work during the night and they have to do some different activities during the day, so they end sleeping just a couple of hours or not enough time, what happens is that they eventually get sick, they need to go to the doctor because the blood pressure is too high. So again, you don't want to get to that point, okay? So I'm gonna give you some recommendations about sleeping times and what to do about sleep. Um, for the picture that I have here in the middle, I, I love it because it's, it basically illustrates exactly what is happening at night or when you are sleeping. And it's the fact that you're giving the chance to your brain to get clean and to be ready to receive more information and to learn more. Okay, so if you look at this table over here, um, this one is provided by an organization in the U.S. called the Sleep Foundation. These are the recommended times. Check out your uh, age and look at the different range and the recommended hours so you ensure that you don't have those toxins in your brain. Okay, so very good. Now we're going to move on to the next factor. Uh, Savita? So uh, I see that we are getting a lot of questions. Uh, maybe we'll take towards the end. Yep. Okay. So uh, as Mariet mentioned that in the beginning, we have six factors and she explained three of those. Uh, the next one is about movement. So movement is very much related to your exercise. And it's not only exercise going to gym, it's exercise and the activity throughout the day. Because when we do the exercise, uh, then the oxygen flows into the brain and that helps us in our brain health and fitness. So, uh, and it's, uh, so the uh, neuroscientists say that uh, doing some stretching also promotes uh, increased focus and concentration. So what we can do is that uh, when we are um, at in the workplace, what you can do for the movement. So we see that when we go to work, most of the people, they just sit on their desk for the whole day. That means you are losing the activity. If you're losing the activity, that means you are impairing your brain health. And now we are working from home. So it's the same situation. And maybe I feel like we are having more meetings back to back. So we don't need to move from one room to another room or one floor to another floor. So we are reducing our activity. 
So what we can do is that some of the um, basic tips is um, just stand while doing your work or you can take some of your meetings on your phone and uh, you can just walk around in your backyard and while having the conversation. Um, you might know that uh, this standing decks are becoming very popular. And if you use the standing desk means um, you are a bit more active than while you are sitting. So it helps in the oxygen flow into your brain, which will impact your brain health. So um, all these small tips uh, help you in um, uh, maintaining the brain health and performance. So the next factor is about the attitude. Attitude is how we think or perceive the events around us. So we know that uh, we have positive emotions and negative emotions um, or having the positive attitude or negative attitude. Positive attitude is more about seeing everything positive around us. So we are all in um, similar situations in our workplace, but some people try to learn from every situation. You always think about the learning. And positive emotions also widen our span of attention. But if you are having a negative attitude, we criticize the situation, uh, which will uh, block our learning ability. The alternative to that would be having the growth mindset. And in agile world, we talk about growth mindset a lot. Growth mindset is all about having an open mind, open mindedness towards uh, learning new things, um, be open for the change, uh, look for the possibilities where we learn from challenges and negative experiences. So many organizations um, help by having the internal coaches or life coaches who actually look into helping people maintaining their attitude or their emotions. Um, I know that these days, uh, many organizations are also spending a lot of effort into mental health programs, which are really towards building a culture where people can talk about their emotions in their workplace and um, get some help. Some of the scrub masters also run some retrospective, uh, which uh, they they can uh, build a good psychological safety in the workplace and people can talk about their stress, their emotions, their reactions towards some messaging or collaboration. So all these uh, things really help you in building a good learning culture in your organization. The last thing is about food, which is my favorite because I'm a foodie. <laughs> But uh, food is very critical because uh, you might have heard about this quote, you are what you eat. That means what we eat uh, is really impact our attitude, our behavior, our health. Um, and neuroscientists say that the food we eat is the raw materials from which we produce those neurotransmitters. So a brain friendly diet is essential. Um, so, um, if you go to the uh, Canada Food Guide, you will get a lot of um, good recipes which you can try that I'm trying these days at home <laughs> to improve my health, brain fitness. So, if you look into all these recommendations, all these recipes are constitute of two main factors, having the anti-inflammatory diet because um, having the stable blood sugar and addressing the inflammation is the foundation of restoring and supporting your brain plasticity and health. The other thing is that um, if you know, our brain are composed largely of fats. All the neurons are fat. And these days people think that, hey, we don't need to eat fats. But the reality is that eating healthy fats is really, really helpful for your brain health. So these are some recommendations. You can go and check uh, Canada Food Guide. And uh, uh, there are many research happened which looked into people's brain who eat healthy food compared to people who eat junk food. And they compare and they see that 
the uh, brain plasticity is better in the people who eat healthy food in their everyday. So uh, we uh, looked into these six factors, uh, which, uh, which are recommended by the neuro agility framework, which help us in improving the brain fitness, which constitute um, us giving the right health and uh, brain openness and fitness to absorb the learning. So even if you get um, help from your organization to go into a training, but you are stressed, you won't be able to learn anything. If you try to learn, you won't be able to uh, remember all the learnings, you will forget it. Um, so uh, this is really helpful. And uh, why we are talking about all this is because um, uh, in organizations, all the uh, HRs or leaders, they just look into what kind of uh, training programs to launch or um, how we can uh, um, actually do some communities of practice. But at the same time, we need to look into what kind of culture and environment we should provide to people so that they can learn. Um, Oh my God, Nawaz kids always eat junk food all the time. Nawaz, it's time <laughs> to help your kids to eat some healthy food. <laughs> yeah, those, those studies, they apply to all ages. So again, depending on your age or on your lifestyle, if you're vegetarian or you eat meat, just look at the guidance, the guidance that you can see in the link over here, and you might find the right combination to keep a balanced diet, okay? Yeah. So what we can do is that we can do a little bit of exercise to capture mm -hmm. some of your ideas based on these factors, what you think you can use in your organization. Um, so we will go into uh, some breakout rooms for 10 minutes. I will let Marriott to explain the activity and I will share the links for each team on the chat and then we'll create four teams. So we have 33 people uh, so everyone will go into three, four teams. Excellent. Thank you, Savita. So essentially, once you jump into the link that Savita is going to share with you, um, and you are in your respective breaker rooms, we want you to, as a group in the breaker room, to select an organization. It can, it can be the organization that you are part of today, and um, try to identify an a scenario in there for that specific organization, where for instance, uh, you identify this is the company and this is the department or this is the company and this is the team. We need to be very specific in there. Um, then you will go, whoever is the one selected to chair the organization, uh, will go and is going to chair the area that these individuals see require some improvement. And then the rest of the group will offer some suggestions to know how they can get better and what are the results that they can get from following that plan. So again, from the group, select one individual. That individual will share the organization and the specific area. What is the issue? And then the rest of you are going to help this person to with some um, recommendations as to how to get better and what are you trying to achieve with this. You will have 10 minutes to go through that exercise and then we'll come back here and debrief for a little bit. So back to you, Sarita. Um, so uh, I'm creating the rooms. I got four rooms. So room one is for team one, room two, team two, room three, team three, room four, team four. You will get 10 minutes and you have the respective link of your team on the chat. And when you go into the breakout room, you will be still able to see the main chat. Okay. Any questions before I send you into two? The People are asking teams. how do they know what team they will be joining. So when you move to the room, you will see on the top, it will show you which room you are in. If you are in room one, so go to the team one's um, uh, link. Okay. Exactly. Okay, very well. We'll be back here. Okay. <laughs> 
You were not able to speak in your rooms. No, we I ran out of time. Room. We, just, we must be up. The ten minutes must be up. Our room closed. Ah, okay. It was supposed mm-hmm. to be closed at ten minutes. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in ten minutes. We were having a very good discussion. Oh, I'm sorry. We we lost like ten minute uh, ten minutes moving from hop into Zoom. Yeah, so wanted okay. to just have some some of the uh, good ideas to be generated. Um, cool. So, when if it's okay, we'll just take uh, five more minutes to go into listening at least one idea from each team, and then we'll conclude. Marriott and I will stay here if you have any questions, or yes. you may choose to join another session in the conference. So we'll we won't hold you back. Uh, team one, anyone wants to share one idea? You can unmute yourself and can speak up. So uh, we Wait. had the idea. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> waiting for somebody. Go to for speak. it. Go for it. <laughs> uh, we we had the idea of of getting some uh, management backing to set aside time because one of the things mm-hmm. is uh, nobody has time to do this. So get the managers to say, hey, we're going to. Um, uh, give you uh, a, an hour or a morning or maybe a Friday afternoon. And then we got into a discussion about what would be the best time to pick, you know, just after lunch. So you've got that good food or at a time when there's not a lot, a lot of stress that, that distracts you or so that was kind of interesting. Mm. Thank you. Um, I, I'd throw mm-hmm. in, this is Patricia, I'd throw in there mm-hmm. that I strongly believe it should come from above us and it should be driven from top down. Um, otherwise, we're always going to have other fires to fight, and this always falls by the wayside. Always. Yeah, yep. we need the support to build the right culture and get the flexibility. Uh, but we can always go to the management and share the ideas. Exactly. We and have. Then, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and that takes us back to the definition of learning organizations, right? When we were saying that it's not only about that single individual, it's about leadership to ensure that they have the right environment for that to happen. Okay. Okay. Um, can we move to team two? Does anyone want to share? Come on, guys, don't be shy. Uh, so yeah, team two, we, uh, we actually were discussing and we ran out of time, but we did uh, discuss some scenarios on uh, the problems we uh, come across. Uh, one was the not enough time to uh, invest in learning the, the project deadlines and the, the release timelines that everyone struggles with. Uh, one area of improvement was uh, maybe investing and getting more lead time with the teams while doing the planning in executing the agile environment could help. Um, how we could get better is um, it's more about transforming the whole uh, organization culture that could promote and thrive learning uh, through allocating time for uh, learning and sharing. Another aspect could be including learning as part of the performance. Uh, for example, some companies like Google and some of the R&D companies here in Toronto also, what they do is they invest, uh, uh, let's say, 20% of the time, 25% of the time for each resource into their own personal learning. They can do their own personal projects, and then they could come up with the presentation or some some demos and then share with the team. So it's uh, not only about personal learning, but when they share, it's about uh, sharing their knowledge with the whole organization what the it results with is that it motivates everyone else as well for for further learning and collaboration. Thank you so much. All these are really awesome ideas. I really like the Google one having 20% personal time for learning. I wish I had that. (laughs) Oh yeah, that will be awesome. Well, I I know an organization that what what they were doing is giving um like four hours every two weeks or something like that in your calendar for for personal development i know other organizations that provide half of the day friday the entire afternoon to do that 
as well. We used so. to have it, Marriott, last time, yeah. once in yeah. a month, half day off. Yeah, once <laughs> in a month. Yeah. Okay, so uh, team three, would you like to share? Uh, I would request to share one idea which you think is uh, the most promising for your team. Mm-hmm. Hello, you can unmute so, yourself. Uh, hi, yep. uh, this is Andrew here. Uh, so team three, we talked a bit more on the uh, spatial distance and, and from being able to connect with uh, other colleagues. So um, we some ideas shared were about um, feeling like you're uh, kind of within a six block radius and not having the opportunity to share learning uh, opportunities and uh, also within a workday because um, you're not typically um, with a designated uh, training environment that uh, having the organization provide times where you can have a break to put toward work. And, and you just mentioned how uh, on a Friday in the midday um, in the past, that was something that an organization offered. So it just seems that a, a bit of the, um, the scheduling and enablement uh, of time uh, is, is something that is, uh, can be leveraged and provided for employees and colleagues to, uh, to be able to advance. Thank you, Andrew. All good ideas again. Uh, we can quickly uh, hear one idea from team four, which is our last team. Don't forget to un unmute yourself. Uh, hi, um, it's funny how pretty much it's the same theme going around from team one to team four. <laughs> It's consistent pretty much that it's lack of time um, for not just for learning, but overall lack of time that we, we are experiencing, ex especially with um, all of us working from home. Uh, you know, there, there have been times or most of the time, if, if I may say it that way, that we've been experiencing lunches being taken from your desk, you know, just just enough time to grab your lunch from from you know from your kitchen or warming it up and uh, that th uh, you know that just doesn't leave enough time for everything else including learning so uh, apart from um, other suggestions that um, teams have already given um, you know blocking time is already covered I think everything pretty much was covered uh, however, one of the main thing is that uh, especially your direct people manager should be made more responsible uh, for considering, um, you know, considering uh, and providing you opportunities for for learning, and and it could be support in any any shape or form, depending on the individual. And they should be made made more responsible rather than oh yeah you should be learning so and so get the certificate that certificate, and we are good to go. It should not be just very vague at that at that level and that would help not just in overall enrichment of all the employees uh, it would actually help the organization by retention of the talent um, and, 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 and because people will feel supported people will feel empowered um, and that that they are important they'll be, they'll be felt uh, valued that is an excellent idea and you're absolutely right time to time the managers they just go and say okay yeah go and take the training but maybe is i think the piece that is missing there is having a really good conversation about why are you taking the training what type of path are you planning to be on right now by taking this training why are you pursuing with this and in why, how that can benefit the organization as well, if, if the plan is for this employee to stay in there. So there are different factors and these are very unique to the individual. So I, I don't see in, in, this is a very common issue is that people just send the entire group, the manager sends the entire group to a specific training, but maybe someone in there 
is not really interested in learning that, right? So it's about just taking the time. I know it's hard because we're all busy, but taking the time as a manager to go there and ask the question, where are you moving forward? Where are you going with this? And um, yeah, and just expressing in that way that you actually care about that person. Okay. okay thanks all the team for sharing your mm -hmm. wonderful ideas. Um, thank you so much for joining today's session. Uh, we also learned a lot of good ideas from you. Um, so uh, this session has been recorded. We'll share the recordings as well as presentation. Uh, we are here.